Uh, well, welcome to Retro Power Uncut episode 109. Uh, and as you probably guessed from that uh, montage there, the uh, big change this week is that the E-Type, Project E E-Type, is uh, now painted. Um, we're obviously going to have upset all of the classic Jag purists by painting it a non-Jaguar colour. Um, but I think the consensus here, and the owner has been and seen it, and certainly his consensus is it looks absolutely awesome. Um, it's uh, Porsche Gentian Blue, I believe, um, which looks, uh, yeah, superb. Uh, I am just uh, made myself a uh, Roundstone Harbour side, which is, uh, having it's tried the four Roundstone blends quite a lot now, I can just tell by the jars at, at home that, that <laughs> Harbour Side is my favourite because there's almost none of that left and there's loads of the other ones left. Uh, so you can get on their website and you can use the discount code uh, RP15 uh, and get a discount on your coffee. And I'm quite excited to say that in time for Christmas, we may be getting our own coffee, our own label coffee. So uh, watch this space on that one. Uh, I've obviously talked about the E-Type already. So, Carrying on uh, E-Type related, uh, let's go over here. Um, after Gaz did a, a, a superb job of the paintwork on that, um, they then got it into the prep area, did all the wet sanding, so that's basically wet sanding it uh, down to 2000 grit, um, and then polishing it with, uh, I think they were using Ferrecla G360. Um, looks great, and then it came around here for the <laughs> perilous uh, job which I, I think there was quite a lot of swearing involved of fitting the front frame um, but that's all on now um, and actually I mentioned that the owner had come up to see the paintwork he also bought up all the parts so it's a bit of a, an odd one this the car had, had actually already been stripped down by the owner um, he's an existing customer of ours the guy we're doing the Jensen CV8 for um, and it started as, will you blast it? And then that escalated into, can you do the metal work? At which point we pointed him in the direction of Andy Hall, who did the metal work. Uh, and then during that time, he said, oh, can you paint it? And we said, yes, if we can do that. And then <laughs> during paint work, he said, oh, and by the way, can you just put it back together again? So uh, we are now going to be just putting it back together again, which I suspect may not be just putting it back together, but, <laughs> but uh, certainly the early stages, uh, are going okay, the rear axle's already been built elsewhere, we've, we've now got all the rest of the parts, so we're gonna start stripping and uh, preparing all the front suspension parts to get it rolling. Um, just quick mention behind me, the Mark II that we built, I think it was nine years ago, um, has now changed owners, which is, and there are very, very few occasions where cars that we've built change hands, but there's been a couple uh, lately, and this one is now changing hands to another customer of mine. Um, so I think tomorrow that's going to be going on our transporter, um, and that will be going to its new home. Uh, Land Cruiser, a couple of different avenues of progress. The Radiator arrived. Um, it's just sitting over there, but that's um, Concept Racing did the fabrication for us. Uh, it, it incorporates uh, a little sort of hatch in the bottom that we machined which is um, a housing for a water to oil cooler for the transmission cooler. And the sort of beauty of the little ha bolted hatch design is we can unbolt that and actually take the core out. So if there's any problems with the cooler core, it doesn't mean cutting the radiator apart, we can actually remove it. Um, so that's going well. We actually asked them to leave the brackets, the mounting brackets off it, because we knew it was gonna be a very tight tolerance fitting within that frame. We, had, we gave them the original radiator as a pattern but because we wanted to maximise the core space and still have the oil cooler in it, we shifted the oil cooler right down to one side and then had a two-part core, so one sits above the cooler and the other one actually goes down the side of it to get a little bit more core uh, area, um, which consequently meant we couldn't quite have the same chamfer in the bottom corner on the side that the cooler was. And because of that, I knew we were possibly going to have to shift the radiator slightly higher, but I didn't know exactly what position to say uh, to put it in so it was easier just to get them to leave the mounting brackets off so Jim could then get it in there get it all aligned check the clearance to the bonnet check the clearance at the bottom uh, and then Scott welded the brackets on for that so that's not in at the minute but it's done and ready to go um, so that's a good bit of progress we can crack on with the coolant plumbing from that Bobby's been on with the wiring installation so I think last week or the week before Max delivered the wiring looms for it 
Bobby's been now getting all those all installed, clipped up behind the dash, get all the bulkhead connectors in, the front legs run down the chassis legs, so he's got all those in. A um, little bit of terminating left to do, um, but that's gone all right. And then John's been on with the fuel plumbing. Um, so he's been mounting the filter, mounting the little Venturi pump, because on this we've got a twin, there's twin tanks. So to keep the tank that's got the injection pump in it full, there's a Venturi pump. So the return fuel from the engine, from the fuel rail back to the tank um, via a little Venturi effect pump, which has no moving parts. It's just literally the, the flow of the fuel going through it that sucks fuel out of the other tank, almost, like a, almost in the same way a paint gun or, gun or an airbrush works. Um, it sucks that fuel out, so it always keeps the main tank topped up. So at the point the there is a linking pipe, but at the point the linking the level goes below that linking pipe, the Venturi effect keeps topping up the main tank. It's the same way a lot of saddle tank cars, like Impressors and things, uh, work. Uh, so John's been installing all of that fuel plumbing under there. That's done. He's just been doing the vent lines, um, but I think with the vent lines done, the only remaining bit of the fuel system is the inlet manifold, which we're just waiting for the drawings or the CAD model of that to be finished. So we can get that machined. Um, actually, speaking of machining, we've got the first few bits of the cam covers through. Uh, Andy at Concept 303 has machined the front part of the um, cam belt covers and the brackets that hold them. The main covers and the main part of the belt cover are five axis jobs. He's only got three axis CNC um, milling machines, so the other parts are going to be done by uh, Alitech. But it's nice to have a few of those bits through, and they certainly, certainly against the 3D printed main parts, they fit perfectly. So <laughs> fingers crossed. It's always a bit nerve wracking because some of the bigger parts, like the cam covers, are quite expensive machining job. Uh, so that's where we're at with that. Uh, if I squeeze through here, uh, main thing on Manta is just the arrival of the remaining parts of the wheels. I don't know if the first bits actually snuck into the last episode, but the f they were in four boxes. Two of them arrived last week and then the other two <laughs> arrived this week, strangely. Um, but all the bits are here now, so I'm now in a position where we can get the, mach the final machining done on those. So what we've received is the inner and outer um, wheel uh, rims and then cast centres that have got the bore and the outer um, mating face that bolts up to the rims machined but they need the, piece, the, the holes drilling for the bolts that hold the split room together and the wheel bolt holes drilling. Um, so we've got them here, we're going to just check all the offsets, work out okay, and then they'll go away to be machined. So we've got the final wheels and then we can do the paintwork on them. So that's where we're at with that. Uh, Mustang. Um, big week for it, actually. Uh, I drove this for the first time. I'm trying to think what day that was. It was, was it yesterday or the day before? It's Tuesday or Wednesday anyway. Um, and. Uh, yeah, it all went, all went pretty well really, um, went, to, went to the MOT station which is probably a couple of miles from here, I know the, these are exempt and a lot of the cars we build if they're standard classics are exempt but I always like to MOT everything anyway just because it gets a, a separate independent set of eyes over it um, and it, yeah it went really well, um, there were sort of two major areas that I want to improve, neither of which were a great surprise. The brake setup, as I've probably mentioned before, that the owner of this supplied us with most of the parts for it. And it didn't have a servo amongst those parts. And actually, being an early car, they didn't have servo assisted brakes. However, I did notice that he had supplied us with some upgraded discs and calipers. And I suspected it probably would, you probably wouldn't have enough uh, pedal effort. So it'd be too much, you'd have to basically press the pedal too hard to get the sort of braking. Uh, performance you want uh, and sure enough yeah that's exactly the case it's it's unacceptably hard to press the pedal to get the, the brakes that you want so we've just got a servo here today actually so we're going to put the servo on that's not going to be a massive job um, and then the other one was the steering this this had the early type power steering system um, which basically has like a valve block on the drag link and then a separate ram it was almost like a modification ford did of the manual power of the manual steering that just added a hydraulic assistance onto it and although we we weren't mad keen on the whole setup we persevered with it because that's what it would, would have originally had and that was what we were supplied with in terms of the parts but having driven it it's just not acceptable the the amount of movement in the actuation block um the actuation valve because obviously when you move the steering it has to move something and this is always the case in all power steering systems there has to be something that moves because it needs uh, you need to be able to mm, shuttle a valve that uh, gives the hydraulic assistance to whichever way you're turning so there has to be some relative movement between the wheel and the actual steering rack or box 
Um, but on this, it's, it's just a massive amount. So you can move the steering wheel quite a lot before it actually starts to steer the car, uh, which gives it this horrible wandery feel. You know, you sort of, you go along and it's cruising okay, everything feels great, you know, uh, and then suddenly the camera of the road will change and the wheels will shift the other way, the other side of the play, and you end up putting, you know, a good few degrees of lock back the other way to keep it going in a straight line. Um, so we've just thrown in the towel really on that steering setup, um, which we should have done to start with, but you know, you sort of persevere and think, well, how, how, how bad can it have been originally? <laughs> um, but the answer is very. So we're going with the later Borgeson type uh, power steering box. So I've just got the parts going for that to upgrade it to that. But in all other respects, I was pleasantly surprised. So I think with the steering play sorted and the brake performance improved, it's gonna be a pretty good car. So once we've got that done, um, I'll do a bit more road testing, see if there's any, anything else to refine on it. Um, we're gonna get the, the wheels refurbed in the meantime. Um, and then yeah, good to go. So we're not far off handover on that one. Um, <coughs> Stratos, uh, I think I mentioned, or maybe I didn't mention actually. Uh, no, the, the owner of the Stratos uh, was over um, beginning of this week. Um, so yeah, he hasn't seen the car for a very long while actually, so it was, it was much less complete last time he saw it, so it was great to show him the car. Um, some of the major visual changes we've done were the fitting of the rear louver panel with the glass, so got all that in, really happy with how that looks. I think the guys were just finishing repainting the two clams last week, um, so getting all of that lot together and on the car and everything looking shiny and at its best. Um, it did really look superb and we've just kind of buttoned up the remaining um, unfinished jobs on the interior. So, you know, visually it's looking pretty much 100% except for some of the areas we're still doing modifications on. So we're going to do a bespoke tail light arrangement, which we've 3D printed but not done the final version of yet. Um, and we're doing a bespoke uh, louver panel to replace the front louvers in the front clamshell. Um, but other than that, it's looking very good. Um, so again, this one's extremely close to completion. Um, and actually the, the owner of this dropped off another project, which is to sort of take over when this one's done. So another future, another future project, which is a Honda CRX, which is a car that I absolutely love. I nearly, very nearly bought one as my first car. Um, and he, and funnily enough, this one has been this guy's first car. Uh, well, sorry, this one was this guy's first car and he's owned it ever since. Um, now he's, he's, a little while ago, he turbo converted it which it would be, it's fine, it's, it's odd for me to say that's sacrilege because <laughs> we spend our entire lifetime modifying old cars. Um, but to me, and I think most people, that, that sort of 1600 VTEC they had in them originally, that, it was just such an iconic engine. Uh, it, seemed, it does seem like sacrilege to turbo it and he's kind of realized that now as well. So I think the plan on that is a quite a, uh, a sort of tasteful restoration. So it almost looks like an original car but with an absolutely mad, screaming, naturally aspirated VTEC in it. So that's a project I'm looking forward to a lot. Um, moving on from that, uh, Morris. So first follow-up was last week. Um, I've been working on a little bit more of the electrics. I've just been testing out all of the heater systems. So I've just had it started again, checking the heater valve works, checking the blowers function properly. And I'm just about to gas the aircon and test that. And this is all sort of leading to the fact that I want to button up all the interior, get the lower dash in. And, and because the um, refrigerant and heater lines are up behind the dash, I want to make sure there's no leaks or no reason to need to access those again now. Um, James has been working on the boot hinges. <clears throat> so when Stu did the boot, he made some fabricated hinges um, which we'd always intended to do a billet version of. So James was just designing and made, I think he's 3D printed some trial ones, which we're gonna go on now. In fact, I think they've already been on. Um, and we're gonna do gas struts onto those so that the boot basically, it already has a remote release. So it'll then, when you actually release it on the remote, it'll gas strut open. Um, so that's a sort of remaining bit there. And he's finished off the door panels, which I think we were on with last week, but hadn't quite finished. Um, so we're, we're actually, pretty much at the stage all the interior bits can go away to be leathered now um, and actually speaking of leather the Land Cruiser leather has turned up which we ordered well we ordered a long while ago it was slow because of the August shutdown in Italy and the tannery doing the weaving was shut down for August uh, and then it finally got shipped by UPS uh, and it took 24 days mysteriously for the, for, the, for the package to arrive. Well, one of the, one of the parts arrived earlier, thankfully the woven stuff, so I was a little less worried. 
but there were two plain hides of leather as well which took 24 days to get here ridiculously so uh, that's all ready for Dean to take as well so he's going to crack on with the Land Cruiser interior now um, so that's that and I think on that note I'm going to hand over to Nat um, I'm just trying to think whether I was going to say something about the Jensen CV8 because uh, you guys visited like, I'm going to hand over to Nat on that one actually there was a visit to see the progress on the CV8 last week and the chassis has just arrived back here today but I'll hand over to Nat to talk about that more uh, and I'll see you next week cheers right well hello folks and welcome to retro power fabrication side and body shop side of the uh, of the wall for this week's Retro Power Uncut. Um, we're going to start with Project Kuma, the second Mark 1 Escort build that's running kind of in parallel at the minute. Uh, I'm going to start at the back because stuff's changed here. You saw last week it had a big hole there. It now has a rear panel there. Tom's done a bit of work on that, fettled all the edges. I think, did we mention that last week? Anyway, if I did, I did. I might be repeating myself. Uh, he's re-tidied he's re up all the edges, squared up the uh, lamp apertures, sorted out the uh, shrunk bits, stretch bits, basically made the profiles all correct on the ends, shaped all them, got them straight, because as, as they come, there's a bit of a step between the top part of the panel and the bottom part of the panel, above and below the light aperture, which means they don't sit dead square to the quarter, or they pull the quarter to it. So we've done that, we've pushed the quarters a bit, which I think you saw last time. Um, we put a pusher in there, moved the quarters a little bit, got all this in, got it all uh, spot welded in place, done all that, and then the last bit to do on that, once we've checked uh, boot lid fit was good, was to braze all the corners. So Tom's done the uh, brazing now on the various lap joints and the corners, which are prone to cracking. Obviously these points here um, where the spot welds aren't right up to the corners if you ever put sealer uh, on well you have to put sealer on this seam to stop water getting into your boot um, if the sealer will just split on the ends and, and then water will leak in around the lamps and the rubber gasket for the light also doesn't have anything to seal again so we put a bit of braze there there a bit of braze above and below that one a bit of braze on all the all the corner points where it's likely to split and the sealer is likely to leak and then bits in the gutters um, around the boot where the water gutter is on the boot stop water running in through there and just give the sealer a good chance of all working so he's got all that done uh, and then also this week uh, Scott has moved well no Tom actually did the boot floor cut out so he's cut the boot floor out and cut the rear floor where it goes up and over the uh, axle area that's all been removed so it's just really the chassis rails in there now and then Scott picked up a bit of work because Tom was off at the beginning of this week uh, he was on holiday Monday Tuesday so uh, Scott did some work getting the original inner arch tubs out um, uh, I think Tom had done the preliminary work but Scott's carried on getting the inner arch tubs out and getting the flanges all cleaned up so we've got something to uh, spot weld the new arch tubs to and then he's done I'll just run back with it in a sec he's then we'd cut the blank pieces then Scott's done the uh, TIG welding job on the arch tubs and got them all welded together now ready to go in so that's all nicely done tank roll corners TIG welded on the corners, TIG welded the butt joint on the top, so they're all um, basically ready for sort of metal finishing and getting into the car now, so that's all nice. We can't really proceed with any of that until the rear subframe is ready to go in, so more on that in a minute. Moving forward from there, we go to uh, another bit. Scott had been mocking up the transmission tunnel. I don't know if we covered that last week, we may have done. And then Tom has now moved on to working on the dash, so as you'll see, there is no lower dash anymore, which is kind of the first stage of the operation. The next stage is over here, and it's all going on today in here. Uh, so Tom's just getting a little jig chasing fixture set up. He's got the dash blank done. Uh, he'd roughly got the dash blank done before. We've done that in advance. Uh, he's done a bit more work shrinking and stretching that to get it all to sit level after it's been chased around. And he's now got his... Um, chasing jig all clamped up into here this six mil plate jig uh, so he can chase this flange in around here and he's got the really noisy tool out here uh, which will be after we've done this bit of filming to power this to push this flange right in this is um 18 gauge steel i think 16 or 18 gauge is it 18 gauge yeah yeah 18 gauge steel so one point well it comes a bit thin so 1.1 mil it should be 1.2 mil it's usually about 1.1 um so it'll push all this through with the uh with the pneumatic hammer and manual hammer and then dollies and whatever to square it all up in there and then again reshape the whole lot that will pull everything else with it so then he's got some reshaping to do to get all that back to flat so that's what tom's on with there 
Uh, I don't think there's anything else changed on the front of the car. And then the other thing I'm working on is over there on the fabrication bench. I've made a start last week. I've carried on a bit this week. I've kind of, um, I'll go around this side actually. <coughs> I've got a bit more done. Um, I'm not uh, solely, I've been, there's lots of other things going on as well. So I haven't had all of my time on this. But I've got it to the point now where the bulk of the TIG welding's done. I've got these reinforcing tubes which sort of roughly go there. I've got to fish mouth these, get these all lined up and put those on, weld those in. And then the joining piece that goes between them, I've got to sort that out, get that in. And then the subframes get in now. I've then just got to a bore through there to put the um, crush sleeve into there, which takes the diff nose mount for, to, for, the, for the front bush on the diff. And then that's all about done. And then that can be put onto the jig fixtures on that select jig so we can get that all lined up in the back of that Martin Escort and then we can start building all the rear floor, arch tubs and all the other sheet metal structure in the back of the car. So that's where we're at on Project Kuma, Martin Escort. Wandering this way, as there's a lot going on here, we will uh, move Mark out of the way and point at this now. Oh, here we go, we'll get a bit of live, uh, live stuff going on here, but the, uh, the E-Type uh, Project Do... Is it, what's, I've forgotten the name of this one now, Project Dewis, isn't it? Yeah. Pro well, Project Norman do this. Um, but anyway, the E-Type, uh, the Series 3 V12 that we're working on, uh, we're basically turning, we, you may recall from previous episodes, we're turning the bonnet into a book so that we can then take a mould from the bonnet um, so that the composite manufacturer can, can take a mould from it. Um, the, uh, the, the start of that, there's various ways of doing that. We've covered this before. Um, but the way we've decided to do it is model it in CAD, scan it, model the changes in CAD, uh, and then basically build a little skeleton of the new shape based on the CAD, all from plasma cut sections in place of the original sheet metal, so that then we've got a basis to build from, and we can then sculpt in foam and filler onto this sort of exoskeleton, if you like. Or it's actually an internal skeleton on part of it and an exoskeleton on other parts of it. But basically, we can build in foam and filler onto this uh, structure that we're building uh, a book. And then, then the mould can be taken from this book. It seemed to be the shortest, most time efficient way of building the book. <coughs> the other, there were various other options. Uh, we, 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 the original thought was, oh, it'd be easy. We can just build, build on top of the original bonnet. But we can't because some of it's negative. Some of it's actually smaller than the original. So the options then were to scan it, generate a CAD model of exactly what we wanted, have that machined as a positive book in MDF. Pretty big job, quite a big machining job. We could machine it directly as a negative mold tool in epoxy board. That's enormously expensive. You know, you're sort of talking 20,000 quid just for the one mold tool, because um, it's huge. <laughs> Obviously, it's a vast tool if you do it that way. The alternative uh, is to machine a negative MDF tool. Both of those, or the, the, the downside with an MDF tool is it's a one-use item. You, you, it, it's sort of shit or bust to be, to, to pardon the pun. It's, uh, if it goes wrong, you're knackered. It's, it's all of your money spent is scrap. Um, so we're a bit loath to go the MDF negative tool route. Um, the MDF positive would be okay. We could use the MDF positive book to then take a mold from, but it introduces another stage to the operation in that we have to machine that and then do, whereas doing this this way, we can sculpt it, check that we like the appearance here. Um, it, yeah, we, we can body prep this and check that we like the appearance of it before the, book get, before the mold gets taken from it. So it actually seems to us the most efficient way of doing it. So that's where we're at with this, is uh, proceeding with building this sort of bit of a skeleton. Um, if I, I'll come around this side actually and go around and point at to Churchill. Stu's working on the Churchill Jaguar at the minute. He's working on, I'm going to climb up on this step actually and point from up here. You don't need to wave the camera too much at it because I know you'll have plenty of footage, but Stu's working on this bulkhead section. It's a really tricky shape, as you'll be able to see in some of the uh, close-up footage. It's a really awkward shape where it's uh, the, uh, a positive curve in one direction and a po basically there's a, an inverse curve. I'm trying to think out the best way of describing it. What would you describe? I'm trying to think of the way to describe the, the, the shape of that. It's, uh, 
difficult. That would be a way of describing it, wouldn't it? Yeah, basically, it's, 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 it's shaped outwards on one part, and then it immediately transitions to the same shape, but inverted on the other half. So it's actually a really quite difficult shape, and it tr tr goes transfers through like a neutral portion in the middle. It's quite difficult to shape, quite quite awkward, and Stu's done uh, a cracking job of that. It's really, really quite an awkward piece to make, uh, but it's looking, starting to come together really nicely now. So yeah, upper bulkhead fabrication, quite time consuming, but really coming together. And that's giving us clearance for the HVAC unit behind it, giving us clearance for the dash, all going to fit down to the tube that you've seen us uh, talk about before. Um, there's a spigot flanged into the bulkhead for the air intake for the HVAC unit. And then on the far side, Stu's also fabricated the steering column mountings, and there will also be a dash mounting. And there's a, a tubular rail that goes across at the sort of the, at the dash, at the, at the driver facing part of the dash. There's another tube that goes across there, which will be carrying the dash. And that's also carrying the steering column mounting. And that tube is now going to be split. There's going to be a solid part, triangulated part, which is carrying the uh, load from the steering column. And then a bolt in section between that and the inner A post this side and the lower part of the dash this side, that's going to be removable just to make it easier to get the HVAC in and easier to get the dash in and out. So yeah, lots of uh, fabrication going on there. It's all coming together quite nicely now. Um, yeah, it, it, it's all that tricky detail part. And certainly this upper bulkhead section with the uh, with the with the recesses in opposite directions is a really quite tricky piece of metal shaping. I was, uh, it's uh, it'll be a good one to watch Stu uh, Stu uh, undertaking that because that's uh, that's not a task I relish. I have to say, <laughs> yeah, quite tricky. So that's where we're at with uh, Churchill Jag. Then conveniently on the lift I've just put it on here because I needed to actually check a dimension so you get quite a good view of the underneath of the project one first Mark 1 Escort project of the of the pair that we're doing this is just yesterday come back from Simpson Race exhausts they've had the car to build two exhaust systems and two manifolds um, to suit to suit these of, both built from this car we're going to assume the cars are identical they should be if we if they're not then we've done something wrong so they should be very very close all the fabrication is done based on CAD drawings that I've done as we've gone along so or not so all the parts have been cut in duplicate as we've gone so they should be very very similar if not identical so the exhaust system system should be interchangeable so they've built us two exhaust systems two manifolds that's just come back it's all very good it needs a bit of adjustment ignore things the, the obviously I'm, I'm sure the uh, eagle-eyed viewers will spot the fact that the tailpipe's touching the valance there don't worry that was an instruction we're actually going to reshape the valance around there that was an ins a specific instruction to matt simpson uh, that we wanted that as tight in i.e touching the bulkhead the uh, valance uh, there so that then we can reshape that to be exactly the clearance that we want around it the uh, rest of it's uh, really nice a couple of tweaks and adjustments as we go that was always going to be the case when he's got very little of the mechanical underpinnings to go in but certainly nothing that undoing a few bolts and tweaking things around won't uh, won't sort so as usual excellent work from simpson um, really happy with that and then you can you get a bit of a view of the assembled i think you'll have seen it in previous episodes but you get a bit of a view of the assembled underside of the car um, and the actually we mentioned it last time but you wouldn't have seen it all complete on the car probably is the was the gearbox cross member this was fabricated quite last minute uh, in the video prior to this car going to simpsons so not last week but week before um, we've, this was mentioned but not actually shown complete and on the car so we've got this these chassis rail sections fabricated in and welded in under the floor then this bolt in cross member with crush tubes through these rail sections these four M10 bolts that carry that, that carries the gearbox load, has also a mounting for the exhaust. That obviously will need more clearance there. That was, a, again, another instruction to Simpson to just run that nice and equidistant in there and we'll clearance this to suit. Uh, and then obviously these little um, fused TIG welded uh, tube, one inch tubes through each end, they'll take a, an AN6 um, air equipped type uh, straight fitting, will pass through those. So it means we can run the two fuel lines through uh, which are that side. So we run the, the two fuel lines through there, the fuel feed and return lines through there. And then we've got two more things. If we want to run the battery cable underneath, we can, we don't usually, and we probably won't. Uh, and then we've just got another option. We've also got a hole we can run the rear brake line through. So that's what the uh, holes in there are for, a bit of uh, planning ahead in terms of uh, the lines running front to rear. You, know, you get a bit of a feel of uh, where we're at with this. this there's various other bits of jobs to do on this, uh, various other bits of sheet metal on the top side of this, and then various other bits of uh, dry build to do. And then this will be stripped down and go onto the rotisserie for all the underside finish welding. As you'll have noticed, there's a lot of half-finished bits underneath. That's just because welding it upside down, there's no point. 
it's going to go on the rotisserie to finish it anyway so we'll do all the underside finish welding with it on the rotisserie so we don't have to do any out of position welding there's no point making life hard no point risking welds being untidy when you can just put the car upside down and do them neatly so uh, that's that i've just thought actually nobody we i uh, should should mention again i'm drinking away from it uh, retro power mugs if anybody wants a mug they're available on our uh, online shop so get yourself a get yourself a retro power mug if you want one uh, they're, they're for sale on there and uh, jolly good they are too uh, and then behind uh, Jamie uh, just out of camera this has just come back this morning as I say it's all go at the minute the those who might not recognize it looking quite like this uh, this is the Jensen CV8 rolling chassis with its steel body sides fitted at the moment this has just come back from KS Composites they have released the body from, they've released the, um, the book, i.e. the body that was attached to this car when it went there. That's been released from the new moulds that they've taken off it. The moulds look really, really good, really heavy duty, done a lovely job of those. Hopefully everything works to plan, certainly looks to be going exactly to plan at the moment. So they've released those. Uh, they've got some more work there's various inserts that they've got to then do into that mold uh, various returns and things on the back there's basically the, the body sits the fiberglass sits over this um, square section or rectangular section here so they've got to do a return the same shape as this um, or the negative of this in the back of the mold um, so that they can mold these these returns into it uh, they've also got to mold the parcel shelf section um, that, that, that sort of goes under the rear window that's got to be molded in and again they can do that from the book that now it's been removed from the chassis they actually got that off intact we were go planning on cutting it in half and they actually got it off intact they've actually cut it in half and well they've cut it up now because uh, it's going to be easier to, for them to work on um, but at the point we they got it off the chassis they actually got it off without cutting it I'd suggested they could just uh, cut it through sort of between the rear window and here there's a short section there which won't interfere with any of the other sections they've got to mold off we'd said it could be cut through there with no problem as it was it came off complete but they have now cut the uh, roof section off so that they can get all the uh, get all the parts they need to get out a little bit easier so yeah they're molding in the returns all around the roof section all the bits that can be molded once they've done that uh, then i think the general plan is that this will the rolling chassis will then go back to ks so that they can then once they've once they're happy with the molds they can make the carbon body then the carbon body can be fitted to this with the, this this can go back to ks the carbon body can be fitted and with that fitted then they can mold all the they'll do wet lay up carbon um, to do the return flanges that meet the body all the way around here so we'll get the body lined up uh, centered lined up height wise everything square and true and in the correct places uh, and then they can do wet lay returns they'll um, put temporary uh, dams in if you like temporary mold sections in underneath and then mold uh, wet lay carbon to do the return flanges that actually locate the body onto the chassis all the way down this line here and all the way around the back of the uh, boot floor it's a, it's a pretty crude design on these but it's crude but effective it just sort of basically bolts on top all the way around there and then slides over and hooks over this bolts through these bolts down those and then bolts onto the top of the body size here they've also molded the the sill sections these were the book sections for the sills they've uh, incredibly heavy in fiberglass format They've moulded those in carbon, uh, they've done the moulds for those to make the carbon side sills, pardon me, as well. So that's all done now. So yeah, basically this is here to keep it out of their way for the moment. Once, uh, once the full body moulds are all sorted, as I say, they'll do the carbon body, then this will go back for the final fit and returns moulding. <coughs> I think that's pretty much where we're at for the fabrication side. I think it's been a bit of a whistle-stop tour this week. There's been quite a lot to cover. I think, have we covered everything? I think we have, haven't we? Yeah, I think so. Hopefully I haven't missed too much. So yeah, I think that's about it for this week, folks. So see you next week.